I would like to introduce our speaker today, Beth Buffington. Um, during the 30 plus years she spent working as a professional architect, Beth enjoyed working with many talented landscape professionals and also gardening as a hobby. She has learned to appreciate a connection with nature and the environment that brings satisfaction and pleasure to many people. As a master gardener, she, ho she hopes to share her love of gardening with others. So we're gonna turn it over today to Beth Buffington. Thank you, Leslie. Um, and I really thank you all for coming. And I, I, uh, I hope it'll warm up a little bit and you can all get out in your gardens this afternoon. We're talking about composting and no-till gardenings. And you may wonder what those two things have together. And, and I hope that, um, that I'll be able to show you that they're both uh, totally involved in our in, uh, improving our soil biology. So again, we're the master gardeners of Northern Virginia. We do have plant clinics and we check out our website at mgnv.org and you can be, uh, have all sorts of uh, helpful resources there. Um, and you can, get, you can get the address for the help desk and learn about our demonstration gardens and all the other things, great things the master gardeners do. It's a wonderful organization. So composting and no-till gardening. So in, with composting, we're trying to create great garden soil. We're gonna talk about what compost is and the fact that it's a natural process and how uh, a, the composting continues to go on below the ground. We're gonna talk about the physical act of making compost, what materials you use, how you build a pile, what's the recipe, and what kind of container you might want to put your compost in. And then we're going to talk about no-till gardening. Uh, why, why are we, we were all taught to till our gardens. We think about getting out in the spring and digging everything up and refreshing our soil. Is that the best thing to do? How about no-till gardening? Why, is, why are we talking about that now? And how does it work? And then we talk about some basic um, methods for no-till gardening and some other uh, really interesting types of gardens that are related to no-till gardening, lasagna gardening, keyhole gardening, and hugelkultur, which is a, a uh, Scandinavian method. So why do we compost? Well, I think most people start composting because they have yard waste and they want to handle it responsibly. Um, so I have piles of leaves and I have, and I have, um, I have the trimmings for my lawnmower and the things that I've pruned off my tree. And I want, and I understand that the, that, that this material needs to be reincorporated into my soil, that that is the healthiest thing for, for my garden. Um, and so how am I going to do that in this, and it will save, uh, things going to the municipal waste, save on soil amendments. So it's a good, um, uh, it's a good thing to do. And it, and it creates a product that's, it's nature's way of recycling it. It creates a product that is of great use to us because it's a valuable soil amendment. It enriches our soil. It makes our soil light uh, and easy to work and, and, uh, um, great, and gr grows great plants. And it's a natural process. So the decomposition of plant material is always happening. If, if people didn't do a single thing, the plant material would still decompose and it would on the ground and it would become part of the soil and it would enrich the soil. And that's, that's how we have soil at all, is this natural process of the decomposition of the leaves um, and the and the plants dying and being um, re uh, reconstituted into the soil, so it's nutrient cycling. So we're taking the the energy from the trees, uh, we're retaining those nutrients, we're pulling them into the soil where they're decomposed by fungi and bacteria. Um, and they're consumed by other animals in the soil, which are loosening the soil. Um, all this variety of life going on does help to suppress disease. And it also uh, promotes biodiversity. So it's all good. 
You know, the, the root systems of plants are an incredible thing. And I don't, I, we don't think about it that way. We are concerned about the top of the plant. I want a plant that's gonna grow about three feet high. I want uh, pink flowers. I prefer them to be in July. Um, I'm not thinking about what the roots of the plants are doing. But what I love about this diagram is that you can see that far more is going on underground than above ground. Uh, it, it is, it is the, the, the life of the plant. It's not just a mirror image. It's, there, it, there, it's going down there. It's the, these roots help pull moisture into the soil and they help pull nutrients into the soil. Um, and in, they are involved with the organisms that feed um, and excrete and decay and release nutrients to the soil. That's soil biology we're talking about. The soil chemistry is important as well. And the two work hand in hand. This presentation is not really going to be about soil chemistry, but I will encourage you wherever you are planning on doing a garden, go test your soil because it's very important that you understand what the soil chemistry is. Um, when you're putting in a garden and, and it'll work hand in hand with, with improving your soil biology. So here's the biological properties of soil, the food web. So you have the plants which are, are creating organic matter, there are fungi, things eat the fungi and the bacteria, things eat the things that eat the fungi and the bacteria, animals eat the things that eat the fungi and the bacteria, and, in, and the birds eat them too. So I mean, the plant, the soil, and the things that the soil contributes to the environment have to do with the, the greater food web. And I like to say there's a party underground. There's all kinds of things going on underground that you just can't even imagine. If you sometimes dig in your garden and you look closely, um, you're, you are seeing just teeming life. Now, most of it is at a very small scale or a microscopic level, but there's billions of bacteria, there, there are fungi. You can sometimes see the, 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 the strands of fungi in the soil. Um, there's protozoa, which provide, as part of their waste, after they eat, they provide nitrogen. The nematodes feed on the bacteria, other things feed on the, on the nematodes. Um, so again, this is abundant life. It's invisible, but there is abundant life in the soil. And 80% of all plants have mycorrhizae on their roots. It's interesting, the ones that don't because of, uh, and I've read a list somewhere, there are things like beets and carrots. And I think that's because um, they're, they're creating their fruit on their root. I'm not sure. Um, but they take carbon from the plant, plant and um, they speed up nutrient and water absorption. Um, and the fungus moves nutrients among the plants. So the plants have a community underground. It's not just a single plant, but they have a community underground and they are exchanging uh, beneficial uh, fungus and bacteria. So one of the interesting things about nitrogen, and we're all worried about nitrogen in our soil because obviously it makes our plants green. Um, so most of our atmosphere is nitrogen, not oxygen, but nitrogen, but it's not available for plant use. So that nitrogen has to be taken down into the soil and broken down um, in a way that is usable to plants. And that's part of this, um, part of this uh, biological process that's going on in the soil. Now, you can see all of this is going on and I love the little mole in there eating the worm and everything. I think one of those, uh, you know, might be, you know, might be anything, but you know, here I see a slug, which I'm not fond of slugs, but they're not all bad. Um, it's because something's gonna come along and eat it. Um, so this is abundant life. When we till the soil, we destroy this. We just destroy this whole, 
whole community. Um, and we take away all of its benefit. So we need to think about that. Is that the right thing to do? Um, so for a healthy soil food web, you want to limit soil disturbance and tillage. You want to not have compacted soil. Um, obviously, you don't want to use pesticides. Um, and you want to have naturally decomposing plant material on your soil all the time because it's going to continuously um, uh, provide that beneficial food source to the soil. But we're going to talk about making compost. So we'll start with what materials should I use? What materials shouldn't I use? Which probably are more are they as important? Um, is there a recipe? Um, how to build the pile and what kind of container you might want to use for your compost? I think. When I first started thinking about doing this presentation, I was thought, I want to start with a container because I think that's something that really um, is of concern to most people. They say, I want a compost, but I don't have a place to put it. I don't know where I can put it. Um, there's so many options. Um, I think we could do a show just on containers for compost, but, um, but we are going to touch on that today. Obviously, the most, the biggest component of your compost is going to be stuff from your yard. It's going to be stuff that you have. Um, it's going to be, you know, leaves and grass clippings and trimmings and all the little twigs that fall out of the trees and pulled annual weeds and all these things, which you're just sort of naturally throwing into a pile and thinking, what should I do with this? Or putting it in a bag and putting it at the curb. So. I think it's important to say all materials that you want to put in your compound post pile have to be pest and disease free. Remember, anything you put in your compost pile is going to stay there. So if you want to be spreading something that's disease back into your garden, that's probably not a good idea. Want to avoid any plant that's gone to seed because it takes between 180 and 200 degrees Fahrenheit to kill weed seeds. In a commercial operation, if you're putting this material out at the curb and your town's going to take it to their lot and recycle it, they're going to have a big enough quantity of um, material that they are going to exceed that temperature probably during their composting season. Home compost piles really rarely get to that temperature. So it's a very good idea to just avoid anything that's gone to seed or you will end up just spreading more weeds around. You also, there's material from your kitchen and I have a lot, I have a lot of waste from my kitchen. You know, all the celery leaves and the um, uh, watermelon rinds and the, all the fruit and vegetables peelings. And one year, I did have a lot of Halloween pumpkins and I just, they were little decorative ones and I just put them out in my compost pile and I had a fantastic crop of pumpkins growing all over my compost pile and they were all open pollinated and I had the most fantastic combinations of pumpkins you have ever seen in your life. Um, and if you want to do that, that's a lot of fun, but for the most part, you want to keep the seeds out. And I'm going to warn you about anything that is at all plant related. And it says here that they need to be clean, really clean, because any animal that's interested, any predatory animal is going to the smallest amount that they can smell on those materials. They are going to be attracted to your, to your compost pile and you don't want to have you don't want rats and raccoons in your compost pile. It's just not a good idea. Other things that you can use are basically organic materials that are, are already processed. So newspaper, shredded. You don't want anything with glossy pictures on it. The, the, the ink in newspaper is um, um, soy based. And so it's completely organic and it's not a problem. Um, uncoated cardboard, you can use wood ash, but it, it does affect the pH. Uh, sawdust the same, the same way, anything that's not partially composted. Um, 
uh, composted animal manure, not dog and cat manure, uh, because again, you don't know what's in there. You wanna be careful about manure too. And so this is Colleen pointed out to me when we were going over this presentation. If you are getting it, know where your manure is coming from and make sure that it is not from treated animals, like a lot of horses and, and certainly cattle um, are, are, given, are given antibiotics and various um, other chemical treatments that you may not wanna have in your compost pile. What's tough to compost? Well, you know, I think everybody's made this mistake because this, this stuff is all woody material. It's all organic material. It will break down, but boy, it can take a long time. So unless you want a really uh, rough um, compost with a lot of chunks in it, uh, you probably want to avoid uh, this kind of material or you want to do it in a separate area. And you never want to compost things like noxious weeds, like poison ivy. Uh, you never want to, again, once again, no, no meat or dairy products or oil or grease, or dog, cat, feces, all of these things are going to attract, um, are going to attract rodents to your pile. Also add in here, it's not on this list, you don't want to compost English ivy because it has uh, it has a natural chemical in it that discourages the growth of other plants. And once you put these things into your compost pile, it will always be there. That, that chemical will always be there. The same thing with poison ivy, you'll have a, a pile full of, um, of compost that has the, the uh, oil on it that can give people poison ivy, which is not too good. And again, because we don't want rats. I mean, no one wants rats in their, uh, in their compost bin. People have a real paranoia about it, um, you know, and rats attract snakes. Not that I'm against snakes, I like snakes, but um, it, you know, it is a whole ecology of its own. So stay away from meat and meat products or dog and cat food. So the rule of thumb is the starting point is that you need three parts of brown material one part of green material. And this is just by volume. So there's no set amount. You can have a tiny compost pile or you can have a big compost pile. And so brown material are carbon rich materials. So you uh, leaves, sawdust, wood chip, uh, chips, the things we were talking about, organic materials that are already processed or used, straw or newspaper. And the greens are nitrogen rich, fresh materials. Um, grass, vegetable scraps. I mean, I think you get the idea. And so you, the browns are for carbon and the greens are for nitrogen. And you're also gonna wanna add water and air. And it's important to put your compost pile in a convenient location where you have access to water because you're going to need to add water. Um, and if you and if it's, and if it's in an inconvenient location, it will slow you down. And then you need some time and some patience. So I'm, I'm laughing at this because the reason that we compost is because we can't be patient enough to wait for nature to do it itself. So we're speeding it up, but it still does take some time. So you're going to take your essential elements and you see somebody here mixing up uh, a mixed pile of compost with a pitchfork and we're gonna add water. And then by mixing it up, we're gonna add oxygen. And temperature is also an issue. So if you want your, you want to have compost that is gonna cook quicker, you're gonna put it in a sunny location. Um, it will speed it up. You will have to add more water and you will have to turn it more often, but it will speed it up. Um, so water is necessary because if, if you don't have water, the bacteria and fungi will go dormant. But if you have too much water, there's no room for the air and it'll kill it. And, uh, and then you will have that horrible smell of things rotting. Um, so again, you want to you be moist as you're turning it. 
you should get a sense of whether it's got too much water in it or not. And if you're getting a lot of rain, you might want to make sure that you're going out and looking at your pile and make sure that it's not getting too much water. And of course, you're going to add air by turning the compost. And the more you turn it, the faster it works. The more green material you put in it, the more water you put in it, and the more you turn it, the faster you're going to create your compost. Um, and now nature is adding into the compost pile the bacteria and fungi and the protozoa and all of that stuff that you need. It's going to come naturally on the leaves and material that you are adding to the, to the pile. But if you want to speed that up, you can add some soil to your, to your pile. I mean, that is certainly um, going to help the process because your soil is full of the, all of this biological material that you need to break down uh, the, the, the material that you want to compost. So what you don't need, and, and a lot of people will try to sell you special tools. Um, you Probably a pitchfork would be, would be helpful. If you don't need bioactivators, what you need is you throw a bit of soil in there. That's gonna do it for you. Um, worms are gonna come to you. You don't need to add them. If you have some, you can put them in, that'd be fine. Um, you know, probably want to add, add lime because that's going to raise the pH. And so wait until you get your, your compost completed and see, you know, where it, how it, it, it adds up chemically. Um, so these things just aren't necessary. The, the finished product is going to be compost. You know, what you really need are the basic things that we've talked about, the greens, the browns, the air, and the water. And the real recipe is this. So you put three parts of browns, you add one part of nitrogen, so it's 75-25, and you chop and shred it. But the smaller the pieces are, the faster it's going to work. Um, and you're gonna mix with enough water to moisten it, and you're gonna stir it well once a week, and you're gonna test for doneness, you know, you're going to be impatient and you're going to want it to be done. And when it's, it'll be done, it, it looks like earth, it has an earthy smell. Um, and so there's different ways you can build your pile. So we're talking about a batch system, a continuous system, and a combination system. So the batch system, it sort of implies that you have green material and brown material, and they're sitting there and they're waiting waiting for you to put in into a pile. And so you're going to take the proportions that we just talked about, three parts brown, uh, one part green. Um, you're going to mix them in the pile, and then you're going to uh, wet them, and then you're going to turn them. And you're going to leave it in place for a while, and then you're going to wet them and turn them. And that in, in theory, if you do this, um, you know, mixing it and turning it and making sure it's staying the right, uh, having the right moisture level, you will end up with a pile of um, compost. That, I, you'd have to be a very, very patient person to do that, but I believe it is possible to do that. Another way to do it is a continuous system. So they actually make a container like this that you put the stuff in the top. It's kind of like it's kind of like an assembly line. You put your materials in at the top. Um, you add water. You mix them, and then you see there's a door at the bottom here that you open that up and compost comes out. You see there's slots in the side that are allowing air in, and you have to like stand up on a stool and mix things in. It's like having a giant giant mixer and you're putting this stuff in and, and you can cover, you can, it's covered so it's protected from other animals getting in there and you harvest finished compost from the bottom. I have never, I, it, I, have, a, I have a composter that is sort of works like this um, and, and it's all right, it, it's fine. Um, there's disadvantages to that as well. Um, the um, 
combination system is, I think, the way most people do it. They start off with a with a continuous pile, and um, and they they're as they're working it, they're seeing that some of their some of their uh, material is getting composted, and they're beginning to sneak the stuff that's finished out of the pile, and then they're replenishing the pile. So they're kind of using it and doing it at the same time. So there's more, you can do it in a very organized way. If you have several bins and the more the material gets finished, it moves to another bin and you start a new pile. Um, most people, especially if they have free form piles, they have areas that are getting more done. They start taking the compost out. It can be whatever you want it to be. So, but you may have some problems. So here's this little troubleshooting, the ammonia smell, too much nitrogen. So you should mix in more carbons. You gotta dry it out a little bit. It's too much green, not enough brown. The rotten egg smell, uh, you've got too much water in there. So you're gonna have to turn the pile and again, add more browns. Uh, the pile isn't heating up. It's nothing's happening. You probably don't have enough nitrogen. You probably don't have enough water. Um, and you may not have enough air. So, you know, um, think through, look at the texture and think what you might need to add. You know, your pile is attracting rats, and we keep talking about this. Don't add food scraps. Don't add cat and dog food. Don't add cat and dog poop. Um, and your, if your pile isn't, in act, isn't active at all, it probably doesn't have enough moisture. This one, the pile is too hot. It says turn the pile. I don't know anybody who's ever had a pile that's too hot. Um, I guess it could happen, and I guess I guess I wouldn't be too concerned about it. It would just mean that it was cooking faster. And there's all kinds of different containers. So everything from just a heap to, as we mentioned before, the uh, kind of composter where the compost goes in at the top and comes out at the bottom, a three bin system, open bins uh, that give you a lot of good air circulation. Um, and then closed bins and stationary units. Um, you can make these yourself and you can buy them in the store. A lot of people um, make them out of um, trash cans that they buy, uh, trash cans with lids and they poke holes in them. Um, that's a perfectly adequate thing as long as you've got enough air circulation. One of the nice things about having the uh, container in contact with the soil is that you do get the benefit of having the bioactive ingredients in the soil having access to your compost. So you're going to get, you are going to get that exchange. You're going to get worms coming up into your compost because there's delicious things to eat up there. And you are going to, and with them are going to come the, the, uh, the funguses and the, and the um, bacteria that are going to help deteriorate uh, the, the material. A lot of rota rotating unit, that's what uh, a lot of people have these. Um, the cost can be higher. They are cleaner because they're, they're separated from the ground. You don't just have a pile of stuff somewhere. Mine is a little slower, mostly because I don't pay attention to it and check on the water in it often enough, and it probably needs a little more water. Um, and as I said, you could get, you don't have to buy these. One of these is a, is a rain barrel that's been converted. One's obviously a, um, uh, intended to be a composter. You could roll it around. You can buy a trash can at the hardware store and drill holes in it. Or there are a lot of people who have cold composting piles where they have a corner of their garden they're not using and they are using it as a compost pile and it is a natural pile in, in contact with the soil. They are adding material to it. They are tending it by making sure it gets some water and um, some air and, and you'll get perfectly lovely pile of compost that way too. Questions? 
Yes, we have quite a few questions, actually. Um, there were a couple of questions about office paper and why is it a problem? Well, if it, it depends on what kind of ink or what kind of finish it has on it. And I mean, I think you just have to know a little bit more about it. I mean, we recommend newspaper because it's, we do know that it has the soy ink, um, which is biodegradable. A lot of other papers have other chemicals in the ink and or, you know, if uh, office paper or print paper has a high finish on it so that it will take the ink from the printer, uh, you'd have to do a little research and know uh, what chemicals were used for that process. Okay, uh, Beth, could you elaborate on a squeeze test? Yeah, I mean, I think it's like, you want it to be moist, but not wet. So when you squeeze it, it should feel moist, but it should still be loose. You shouldn't squeeze together and be like a glob of glob of goo. You should feel that it's moist. Let me, let's see, what's a good example of that? Um, well, I mean, I guess it would be the difference between a wet sponge and a dry sponge. You know, when you squeeze a sponge, you can it's really wet, water comes out of it, that's too wet. You squeeze it and you can feel that it's moist but uh, it doesn't clump up, uh, that, would be, that would be it. Okay, um, someone asked, uh, are, is putting commercial flowers in your composter a concern because sometimes um, pesticides are used on them? You know, I guess that would, in my mind, you know, some people would say, yes, you wouldn't want to put them in. In my mind, that would be a question of volume. Um, you know, if it was all of your, all of the material you were putting in, you might be a little concerned. I imagine that it would be kind of diluted uh, by, you know, by, by volume, you know. So you might think about that as a kind of a, a volume issue. Um, okay. okay, do you recommend people use a thermometer for their compost pile? Well, I guess I, I would say, I guess I don't. <laughs> I guess <if> you, <laughs> I guess I'm kind of a sloppy composter. Um, I, I mean, it's this is like happening naturally. I don't. If I were really trying to get it up to a certain heat, then I would get a I would get a thermometer. If I were, for instance, very concerned that my um, compost reached a certain temperature so that it killed weed seeds or or something like that. Um, uh, I think you should get a thermometer and, and see how it's doing. Uh, for the most part, I really see this as a natural process and it's going to happen with or without us. And um, uh, we're just trying to speed it up a little bit. Um, one year I made compost, I read an article about it and I made compost in um, black plastic garbage bags over the winter. I filled it up with leaves and stuff and, I, and it turned out great. Um, because it really heated up over the winter. Uh, if you feel like you need a thermometer, you should get a thermometer. <laughs> okay. Um, someone else asked about twigs. They said that they have put twigs in their compost and they don't break down. So what's the good of having twigs in your compost? Well, you know, that was the sort of like that slide, like, you know, the nut hulls and um, uh, uh, corn cobs and things that don't really break down. You know, the thing about twigs, and I think one of the reasons that it's recommended, they do recommend that you break them up, um, is that they do keep it loose. And, and, and one of the things that, you know, you need to be concerned about is that you don't want it clumping too much. You want it to have, um, uh, elements that are loose. And you may end up with perfectly nice compost that has some twigs in it that aren't really composted. And you can either dig them into the ground or you can pull them out, you know. Uh, uh, it's, you know, it's something to consider for sure. Okay. Um, I think you would say yes, but someone asked specifically about chicken manure and if you can put that in your compost or is it too hot? You know, I mean, yes, you can use chicken manure. Um, and, and again, so manures are, are on the green side. They're, they're more of a green product, right? 
They're brown, but they're green because um, they have a lot of nitrogen in them. Um, and, and if it's too hot, um, then you'll have to add more brown. Uh, uh, so you don't want to burn it up, but you're not, see the chicken manure is going to burn up your plants, but if you're composting it, it's just going to go to compost. Um, but again, if you are going to use a, what you consider to be a hot material, you're going to add one part of green, three parts brown, and you're going to turn it. You're going to turn it and make sure that it's getting enough air and that it's uh, so it's able to decompose. If there were a couple of questions about tumbler composters. Uh, are they only batch composters, but someone mentioned that they had one that had divisions that could be added to periodically. Yeah, mine's not a batch composter. I mean, I just add stuff to it all the time. I've got, I've got one of those ones that's, that's two. Um, so the idea is you're, you're putting things in one of the bins and turning it, turning it, turning it. And then at some point you decide that it's compost, and then you start the second bin. I think the idea with those two bin ones is that this is for this year. I'm putting all of my all of my stuff in for one year, and then in the spring I'm taking it out. In the meantime, I've started the other the other batch for this year. Um, that works as long as you remember which batch you're working on. And do you ever? Um try and do a compost pile, say, on top of a raised bed? Just put the compost right in the garden that you're going to prepare for the following year? Yeah, that's, in fact, that's a, that's a little bit what we're going to talk about in the next section. So no-till, or also called no-dig gardening. Okay, so we're going to start off talking about why we till our gardens and why we might not want to till our gardens. We've already talked about that a little bit, that it destroys, destroys our soil biology. We're talking about how no-till gardening works and about starting a new-till garden, um, about cover crops in a no-till garden, and then these three specialized types of no-till gardens. So why do we till our gardens? Traditionally, it's been a way to manage efficiently the soil. It plows under plants from the previous season and weeds. It's a place to incorporate manure and fertilizer. And certainly when you're in an industrial farm type um, context, you have a lot more manure, uh, you have a lot more materials that you want to incorporate into the ground and you have the equipment to do it. Um, and that equipment gets more and more efficient all the time. It lightens the compacted soil. And, and all soil on a farm is getting compacted because they're driving around on it on heavy equipment. And it creates a light, uniform uh, soil for seeding. It's very easy to seed. It's easy to seed in rows. Uh, it ensures a uniform harvest because the plants are planted in nice, even rows. However, you know, as we've already discussed, every time you till up the soil, it destroys the soil biology, which means you need to add more. You need to add more manure, more fertilizer, more materials to build up the soil. So it's, it ruins the natural system underground and all these things are just gone. They're just tilled up and ground up and I mean, certainly they come back, but they, they cannot come back at the same, I guess, efficacy that they were before. Well, so why would we go to no-till gardening? Well, it helps preserve soil moisture and fertility. You know, one of the big problems with industrial farming is that we've lost a lot of our topsoil. It's blowing off in the wind, it's running off, into the Chesapeake Bay and the Mississippi River. Um, and we can't afford to lose that. It's taken us millions of years to build up what little, what little soil we have. Um, so a no-till garden maintains our healthy soil biology, keeps the moisture in. And then 
it is less work a lot, a lot in a lot of places they write about this as the lazy man's garden you know it should have fewer weeds so now we have a whole system where we're constantly uh, poisoning the weeds on a commercial farm so that the plants can grow faster than the weeds but the reason, reason the weeds are growing is because as we till the soil up, we are bringing weed seeds to the surface and all the weed seeds are in the top 12 inches of soil. So they're constantly being tilled up. So you've got new weeds every year that you have to get rid of. If you just are smothering the weeds, they're gonna go away if they don't, if they don't, if they can't photosynthesize, they can't grow. So in the long run, run a no-till garden is easier to maintain. So how does it work? So you're going to start with the surface of the garden where it is. You start where it is. You're going to plant on top of it. You'll be creating a new surface and you're going to layer composted material on top of the soil. This can be in a raised bed. It can be over a cover crop. And it's going to provide for continuous soil improvement. So you can see in this photograph on the top, so there is, they have mowed down the plant material and put down paper underneath the compost. And you can also see in the lower image, it's compost over newspaper, wood chips and manure. Starting any no-till garden. You have to be in the right location. So you can't expect this to make up for the fact that you have bad soil or bad drainage. Well, it could be make up for the fact you have bad soil. Bad drainage, not enough sun. You know, if that you want to start in a good location for a garden where you have access to water, you have good drainage, good soil, and sun. Get your soil tested because soil chemistry does make a difference. So again, you're not going to instantly make up for a bad soil condition. You wanna mow existing plants to the ground. So again, this is, um, again, we're talking about this. This is my idea that there's a party underground. That not pulling the existing roots because that root in the soil is still benefiting you even when you cut the plant off because it still, it still is able to transport you know, moisture down into the soil and as it deteriorates, it will be eaten up by the, the bacteria and the fungus in the soil and providing uh, a rich environment for the soil, even when the plant above is dead. So we're going to cut, mow the annual plants down to the ground. So if you're going to start a no-till garden in the fall, which might be ideal, although the next slide will be starting in the spring, um, you're going to cut existing plant material to the ground. You're going to cover that with layers of newspaper because basically you're going to smother the weeds that are there. Uh, then you're going to wet that newspaper so it's soaking wet. If you have really heavy weeds, you're going to need to use a cardboard because otherwise they'll come right through the newspaper. And I've been helping my uh, neighbor do put in a new till garden, uh, no-till garden uh, on a section uh, underneath his trees and uh, basically a weedy area under his trees. And I've already found that. Um, while most of the weeds are just fine underneath the new several layers of newspaper, the dandelions come right through, they come right through. So we had to weed out the dandelions one by one. That's been an interesting process. So you're gonna cover the, the then you're gonna put down, so again, we're almost like creating a compost heap on top of the ground. So we've got the wet newspapers down, we're putting three or four inches of green material we're covering with a couple inches of composted manure and then three inches of brown material and we're watering it. So in effect, in effect, we're creating a whole horizontal compost layer. We're going to water it well and we're going to let it sit over the winter. Um, if it may compact down and you may add to need to add more material in the spring. 
Also remember what you're creating around the edges of these gardens are pathways. You're gonna to need to create a pathway with uh, some kind of a dry mulch material, um, uh, hay, straw, or hardwood bark mulch, because you're not gonna to wanna to walk on these beds because you do not want to compact them. So then planting the no-till garden in the spring or starting a no-till garden in the spring, you're gonna mow the cover crops. You're gonna move the mulch aside to let the soil warm up. You're gonna plant the plants directly on the soil. So if you have newspaper, you wanna cut a slit in the newspaper. Um, if you have larger plants, you're gonna punch a hole through the newspaper and plant them down in the soil. And then you're gonna add more amendments on top of that. So you're gonna mulch everywhere to eliminate weeds. Okay, remember if you started with cardboard, you're gonna to need to plant shallow rooted plants the first year because the roots will not be able to get through the cardboard. Um, so the shallow rooted plants are, are, the, are the leafy green plants like broccoli and spinach and lettuce, kale, onions, and chard. If you wanna plant bigger plants like tomatoes or um, eggplant, you're going to have to punch through the cardboard, which is going to be uh, way harder. So you may want to wait, you may want to phase your beds uh, to uh, have those larger plants somewhere else. So if you're planting um, over an established garden, established lawn or perennial bed, you know, paper and cardboard may not be enough to smother those plants. So remember, we wanna smother them, we wanna keep their roots intact. We wanna take advantage. We're leaving them there because we wanna take advantage of their roots, which are continuing to go down in the ground. And we wanna take advantage of the green top material, that's our nitrogen. Um, but we may have some plants that are just not going to be killed that way. So one method is to cover the bed with cardboard. Um, and I'm, I'm talking about corrugated cardboard here. Um, and then landscape fabric. So you know what lands, landscape fabric is, is fabric you can put down, plants don't go through it, but water is uh, able to, to, uh, to go through it. Um, and then you wanna leave that in place for one season to discourage weeds. And you're not gonna, it's not gonna be weed free. You still are gonna get some weeds. When the weeds are under control, you can punch through the tarp, the, uh, the landscape fabric, and punch through the cardboard and plant. Or if you have something really persistent uh, or um, like an established lawn, you may want to solarize it. And solarizing just means that you would put plastic down over the area and you would let the plant cook. Well, this is gonna be faster. You might not have to do it for a whole season. You could check it after you know, three months and see if basically the plants are dead, but they're gonna be cooking underneath that plastic and they're not gonna be getting any moisture. So um, that usually will take care of them. So then there's an all compost method. So we talked about this where, uh, where you mow down all the weeds, you lay down the newspaper or cardboard, you moisten the paper, and then you add compost. So instead of adding layered material that are gonna become compost on top of this bed, you're adding compost right to the top. So you, if you have a big compost bin and you have a lot of compost that's ready to go, um, this would be the way to go. And then you can plant right in the compost. And you wanna create walking areas around the edge again uh, because you don't wanna compact the soil. And then after you plant, you wanna make sure to mulch this because weeds will grow in the compost as well. Um, again, this is you, the plants can be planted immediately. Same thing about if you're using cardboard and you want to continuously add compost throughout the growing season and don't walk on the composted area. 
So there's one other method, and I, I this is, was only mentioned in one book that I read. I think it's an interesting idea. Um, you start with an existing garden and you dig shallow trenches and plant seeds. And you mulch heavily around the plants. I mean, heavily, eight inches of hay and leaves, the most part for your dry, um, dry brown material. Um, and once the plants start to grow, you add more mulch. So you're building up this mulch around these plants that are coming up through this deep mulch. Mulch is so deep, it is, um, it's, it is stopping anything, anything from growing except in the areas where you're allowing light to get to it. Um, you never leave the soil bare. You continuously add more of this mulch. The advantage to this is that you can walk on this because it gets to be so deep. It'll be a foot deep or, you know, 15 inches of mulch and you're always adding more and more. One problem is that the mulch can, can hold a lot of water and it can damage the plant stems. So, you know, you have to be careful about that. Um, it's, and I think it's a very interesting uh, approach. Cover crops. So one of the things that's really recommended for this type of gardening is when you're not in an active season that you would plant cover crops because you're always in this process of mowing down the crops and putting a new uh, compost bed on top of it. And um, again, they hold the soil in place, they harbor beneficial insects, they suppress unwanted plants and weeds, um, and they help, the roots are always helping break up the subsoil. You've got to remember that these crops have to be harvested before they go to seed or you're going to just have another crop of this material on your site. Um, so again, you're gonna put them on top of the no-till bed in the fall. You cut the cover crops before flowering. Um, you sow seeds through the cover crops and then you remulch the beds and add manure. So Lasagna gardening, and a lot, a lot of people talk about this. I've been in several presentations where people said, you know, said that they use this. It's very much like no-till gardening. You're doing a horizontal bed of compost and the layers. So you lay down uh, a barrier of newspaper or cardboard, and you're alternating green and brown materials and you're not turning it and you're planting plants directly into that bed. I think this is a fascinating idea, this keyhole garden. Um, it's a raised garden bed and in the center, as you can see in this uh, a diagram here, you have your compost heap and you are going to water through that compost heap and it is going to take the nutrients from your compost and they're going to flow into your beds around the garden. And you have to obviously continuously be putting more products into the center of the composted area and you'll have to get up there and, and certainly do some turning of that material. Um, and that's what the keyhole is for so you can get access to that center area. Uh, which I just, I. I wish I had room for one of these in my yard, I would try it. Uh, the other, uh, other version of this, which might be of, of certainly of some interest to people in our area, because a lot of people do have soil which is not good or is, has a very high water content or is a very, uh, has marine clay or something which they are not able to garden in. And they may have access to logs or, or piles of wood. Um, so you build a pile of wood on top of the ground and you cover it with compost and soil. And the wood draws moisture into the mound. Um, and the wood breaks down and as it breaks down, you, you plant your plants on the top. And as the wood breaks down, it's providing nutrition for the plant material. This is a very slow process. Um, but it might be, again, of interest to somebody who has access to those materials and has that kind of situation in their yard. 
So I think that's the end of the presentation and we're ready for questions. Okay, thank you, Beth. Um, there were a couple of questions about English ivy. The first one was, can you do no-till gardening on top of English ivy? And also the question included wisteria. Well, you know, again, I, I, what I know about English ivy, and I wish I had written it down somewhere, but it, it does contain, a. it's one of the reasons that it, it chokes out everything else in the garden is because it does contain this chemical that discourages the growth of other plants. And it's why it's so destructive to the trees too. I mean, it, it, it is like poisons other plants. So I think it would be a mistake to try to do this on top of ivy. It would be a wonderful idea. I think if you could pull all the ivy off the top, um, it might work, you know, the roots might be okay, but I think you'd have to do a little bit more research on that. How about solarizing English ivy? Is that possible? It took me three years to get rid of the ivy in my backyard. <laughs> Uh -huh. I mean, it's just persistent. So solarizing would certainly kill the tops of the plants. What the thing about ivy is that it, it's all interconnected underground and it, and it, I, I, it, it manages to come back when you, even when you think you've entirely gotten rid of it. Um, it's worth a try, I would say that. If I were had it to do over again, that's what I would do. Um, there was a question about whether you could build a no-till um, garden over chickweed, and I would assume you'd say yes, and that you yes. need to dig up the roots. Yes. Okay. You don't dig up the roots. You just mow it down. Right. Um, is using mushroom compost okay? Sure. Mushrooms are great. Uh, someone had a keyhole garden and wanted to use the lasagna method and wondered if they did that now, would they be able to plant this May? Yes. I think the deal about the lasagna method is you plant right into it. It's right there. Okay. Um, let's see. The final question was um, in the uh, log, uh, I forget the German word. The Hugel culture. Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, does that encourage termites at all? Oh, I suppose it would. Probably don't want to put it right next to your house. In that case, termites might be good though, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, termites are very interesting. Um, they, uh, they actually live in the soil and then they go, they don't, they don't live in the wood. They go and eat the wood and then they live in the soil. So I would think that they would actually be a great, be a great addition to your garden because they're in the soil, like, a, well, like an ant hive. Only they're termites. They they have a that kind of a, a social structure, I think, in your soil. Mm -hmm. And then they would go and eat the wood. Um, I, I suppose your your Hugel culture. A pile would disintegrate more quickly, but that might be okay too. <laughs> yes. Um, good. I think that's good on the questions. Thank okay. you very much. All right. Yeah, lovely. Well, uh, thank you all for coming. Um, and thank you all for composting. <laughs> and I hope you all will try no-till gardening. Um, and and if you do, get back to us and tell it how, how it goes and, and send us pictures. Beth, I was impressed with how many people said they were already doing the Hugel, Hugel culture or whatever. Really? Yeah, and um, also some people had keyhole gardens too. So I thought that was pretty neat. I, I think those are both great. I wish I, I don't have, I have a small lot. <laughs> so I don't have to run over to do it. So I'm gonna make my son do it. He has some land uh, out in Warrington. 